Okay, so what I want to go back to today is the discrete Fourier transform, which we introduced last time. And that's basically a uh, you know, entirely numerical thing that MATLAB does when you ask it to compute a Fourier transform. And we showed that really what you do when you do an FFT in MATLAB is you are computing the DTFT, the discrete time Fourier transform, which is ideally this continuous function of omega, and you're sampling it at these equal intervals. So if I ask for an, a 10 point DFT, what I'm getting is the DTFT sampled at 2 pi over 10. Okay, so I'm getting these equally spaced things. And if I want a, a more finely spaced uh, DTFT, then I just ask for a longer FFT. So I would say, okay, and, you know, give me 200 points or 1,000 points, right? Um, so in that way, basically MATLAB or any other you know, chip or something like that can do something that approximates kind of like the continuous time operation or the continuous frequency operations that we want. And we'll talk a little bit more um, in the future about um, you know, how good that sampling has to be, right? That's what the sampling theorem is all about. So what I want to focus on today and in the next lecture are uh, efficient methods for computing the discrete Fourier transform, right? Because the MATLAB command is called FFT. It's not called DFT. And the reason for that is the F stands for fast, okay? So as soon as people realize that they wanted to do Fourier transforms, you know, if you look at the naive way of writing the Fourier transform, which we're going to do, you realize that it takes potentially a lot of multiplications and a lot of adds, right? So this is not a computational complexity class. So I'm not going to focus, like, super much on analyzing the big O of whatever of an algorithm, but I do want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, it became clear that, you know, if you wanted to compute the DFTs of matrices that were, you know, thousands of elements on a side, that you would probably need to uh, have a more efficient method, otherwise the computers of the day couldn't handle them, right? And so these efficient methods were discovered that make the whole DFT process a lot faster. And so that's what I want to emphasize in the next couple of lectures, okay? So let's just revisit the formula for the DFT, right? So the formula for the DFT is basically saying I have n, capital N numbers, which are these little x's coming in, and I multiply them by this complex scalar. And so here, n ranges from 0 to n minus 1, and k ranges from 0 to n minus 1. So basically, I take capital N numbers in, I get capital N numbers out, and those capital N numbers that I get out are samples of the DTFT. So it's kind of like a discrete representation of frequency. Okay. And we also abbreviated this to say I could write this in a slightly more compact way by giving this complex exponential a name. So I would say that I have this, where this capital W of n is defined as e to the minus j 2 pi over n. And just as a reminder, that's like saying that I have, you know, this is my w of n. And if I were to take this to the n power, I would come all the way back to 1, right? So this is like, you know, an nth root of 1, right? And the other nth roots of 1 are what I get if I were to, you know, square it, cube it, take it to the fourth power, and so on, right? So there are basically n nth roots of 1. So if I have wn, wn squared, wn cubed, dot, 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 all the way up to wn to the n minus 1, uh, to the, yeah, to the n, which is actually 1 itself, these are all nth roots of 1, right? Just like plus and minus 1 are the square roots of 1. There are two square roots of 1. There are n square roots of 1 in general, and those are evenly spaced around the unit circle. Okay. okay. So in general, for the moment, we're going to assume that the input and the output could be general complex numbers. Okay. Um, and let's think about you know, how many multiplications and additions I need to do to accomplish this computation. Okay. Well, let's think about it, right? So that means that fundamentally, uh, to get this value, I need to do n complex multiplies, right? Because inside this sum, I have n products, right? And then I have n values I'm computing. So overall, what I have is uh, n squared, 
the box here. So I have n squared complex multiplies. And then inside here, I need to add up these n numbers. That's basically like n minus 1 additions inside this sum. And I have to do that n times also. So there's n times n minus 1 complex additions. OK. And you know, you can figure out how many corresponding real multiplies and real additions that you need to do. I mean, basically, it's going to be more or less four times the number here, right? So if I want to do a complex multiply between a plus bj and c plus dj, right, that means I basically have to compute these four real products, right? There, there are some faster ways of doing that if you really needed to. But you know, for the moment, the point that I want to emphasize is that this whole thing requires order of n squared operations, OK? And you know, when n is like 1,000, a 1,000 a dimensional vector, that's like a million operations, right? And so you know, as n gets bigger, things get worse and worse, right? Um, so what can we do to make this process more efficient, right? I mean, on the face of it, if this was just a normal matrix, right, a matrix that had, say, random entries, there really isn't that much more I can do to make my life any faster. I mean, matrix multiplication is inherently this n squared operation. But what we're going to use is the fact that this is a very special matrix multiplication. If I look at what this matrix multiplication is, the entries of that matrix fall apart into really interesting and simple patterns that make our life much easier. And that enables us to drive the computational cost much lower than n squared. Okay? And so that's what is called the FFT. So the FFT is not like a single monolithic algorithm. I mean, the FFT kind of generally refers to any scheme that makes the DFT faster. Okay. So the FFT stands for fast Fourier transforms. And in general, these algorithms reduce the number of operations to the order of n log n. And I, you know, if, if you want to be precise, this is like log 2 of n. I mean, that's just a factor, so it doesn't really matter. But n log n, right? So when n is equal to like 2 to the 10th power, which is, again is approximately 1,000, right? that's the difference between a million operations for the naive way and 10 times 1,000, which is 10,000 operations for the smart way. Right? So that's a savings of 100 right? just for a matrix that's 1,000 elements long, which is really not that long. Right? So we can see this is really worthwhile if we can make it happen. Okay? And so what we're going to do to make this possible is observe a bunch of things about the character of this of this uh, F, of the DFT thing. The main idea is going to be decompositions into smaller DFTs. So there's going to be kind of this neat way of recursively breaking up a long FFT into a whole bunch of shorter FFTs, which are easy to compute. We're also going to leverage some simple things, right? So for example, you know, there are a lot of simplifications that relate to this Wn, right? So for example, we know that whenever I see Wn to some you know, integer times n power, that's equal to 1, right? That's like going around the circle k times and ending up at 1, right? So anytime I see something like this, I can immediately turn it into a 1. So multiplying by this number is no longer a complex multiply. It's just basically the identity. Nothing is happening, right? And in the same way, if I have Wn to the, you know, n over 2 times some odd k, right? So say I have, you know, w6 to the third power, right? So that's like saying, suppose I have w6 and I take that to the third power, then I end up at minus 1, right? <coughs> so those are some other special numbers where I end up at the opposite end of the circle. And multiplying something by minus 1 is, again, nothing computationally stressful, right? It's just like flipping the sign. So that's not a problem either. And then there are a bunch of you know, facts, right? So we're going to definitely leverage throughout this whole process that remember that when I do the DFT, right? When I do this operation, that I'm assuming that x of n and x of k, capital X of k, are periodic with 
period capital N, right? That means that really I'm thinking of the input sig signal as a periodic discrete time signal. I'm thinking about the output frequency as a periodic, you know, set of, of numbers. And so that means that whenever I see something like, you know, Wn to the, you know, N K plus capital N or something like Wn to the K N plus N, right? So these numbers are going to be bigger than N, but I can always take out multiples of capital N to come back to a simpler number, right? So even though I may see numbers like this in the matrix, there really can't be any more than capital N unique Ws inside the matrix I need to use to, to compute the FFT. Um, so this is just kind of like I guess I would call these periodicities. And then there are symmetries, right? For example, if I have Wn to, you know, some power like this, again, I can take out this Kn and just say like this, right? So that's kind of like saying that, I guess I have to have a K here, Kn, right? Which is the same thing as Wn Kn conjugate, right? Again, conjugation of something isn't that bad either, right? So anyway, we're, we're going to talk about ways of leveraging these kinds of pieces of information to make our life easier. And so what I want to talk about first is a basic algorithm that's called decimation in time, okay? And for this, we're going to start by assuming that n is an even number. Capital N is an even number. And, you know, generally, that's not a restrictive you know, assumption because, you know, keep in mind that many times when I'm doing the DFT, you know, I'm thinking about the DFT as a way of sampling the underlying continuous frequency response, right? And so that means I'm often free to choose what capital N I want, right? So if I have a weird FFT that's of length 987, I could just bump that up to 1,024, right? And then just get a finer sampling. So that's generally not an issue. So let's write again. Here is my formula. And because I'm going to be writing this so many times, I'm definitely going to stick with this WN notation. OK? So since this is an even number, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the sum into something that involves only the even entries of x and something that only involves the odd entries of x, right? So I'm not changing anything by saying, OK, I'm going to sum this over the even entries of x and the same sum over the odd entries of x. And now I can say, OK, well, if n here in this sum is even, I can think about that as n equals, you know, two times some integer, right? So like, you know, this is a different way of saying if this is going from, say, you know, 0 to 4, I can instead make this sum go from 0, 1, 2 and write it in this way. So it's like saying I have a simpler index that goes up to half the length and I write my x like this. Okay. So it shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself that this is the same as that, right? All I'm doing is I'm kind of renaming the index, okay? So if this n used to be, like I said, if this n used to be 6, here I'd be summing over n equals 0 to 4. Now here, this little r would go from 0 to 2, and I'd be summing again from, you know, r equals 0, 1, 2, but that would be the same as x going from 0 to 4, right? So I'm not really changing anything in this sum. And the same way, I can write this guy. So how do I write an odd number? I could write an odd number like 2r plus 1. Right? So again, if this was equal to a 6 DFT, this would be like summing over 135, and this would be like summing over 135. OK. And so now I'm going to observe the following, right? So I am going to say, OK, I'm going to write this in a slightly different way. So 
So I'm going to kind of write this wn squared to the rk. I'm going to take out this factor of wn to the k. And keep this guy. And again, I can take this as wn squared to the rk. Right, so I didn't change anything. I just kind of put some parentheses around things and took a factor out, right? And so now, this is kind of where the magic happens, right? Where I say, okay, well, here, this looks like I'm taking a length n over 2, you know, thing that looks suspiciously like the formula for a smaller DFT, right? So what is this wn squared, right? Let's just take a quick look at that. So remember that, say I have, again, n equals 6, right? So if this is like w6, this here is like w6 squared, w6 cubed, and so on. So here, if I were to square this guy, I would get this. And this is the same thing. Here, I'll just mark these guys off. Right? If I bold these guys, right, this is the same thing as w3, right, the cube root of 1. And this is the same thing as w3 squared. And this is the same thing as w3 to the 3, right? So when I'm looking at just every other one of these guys, I'm actually looking at a length 3 DFT instead. So if I go back to this, what I'm going to do is everywhere I see this, I can turn this into a w of n over 2. So what I'm going to do is exactly that. So I can say that that sum equals, maybe I should just put this on top here. So that sum equals this guy. And in this way, what I'm doing is I'm making this look exactly like two shorter DFTs. Right? So this here is like a length capital N over 2 DFT of the even entries. And this here is like a length n over 2 DFT of the odd entries. OK. And so I can actually write this in a slightly more compact way. For example, you know, let's, let's call this g of k plus wn to the k power h of k. Right, so this was my formula for the Fourier transform, the DFT of x. Right, and so the idea here is that what I need to do to compute this, for example, say this was a length 6 DFT, that's like saying I compute this length 3 DFT and this length 3 DFT. And I basically, to get the you know different elements, I, different, I combine the elements in different ways. And so the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, even though I'm doing two shorter DFTs here, I get the entire double length DFT because I have to kind of multiply through by this factor as k ranges from 0 to n minus 1, right? So one thing to keep in mind, for example, is that say, you know, n equals 6, that's like saying that, you know, g ranges from 0 to 3, and so that's like saying that I have you know, three unique entries. And when it comes back to looking for x of 3, this guy wraps around. So when I need to call a higher entry of k than I have in my shorter DFT, I just wrap around because I know this is a periodic thing. OK. So I'm going to draw one picture, and then I'm going to pause and ask for questions. So let me just draw a more graphical way of, of what I just said, right? So kind of more graphically is saying, okay, so suppose I want to compute, let's say I want to compute an eight-point DFT. 
because that's a nice, nicer number than six. So what I just told you would be, okay, I take the even entries of x, and I take the odd entries of x, and I put these guys through a length, you know, n over 2, which equals 4 dft. And I put these guys through another 4 dft. What I get out are four numbers here, and I get four numbers here. And then what the formula on the previous slide tells me to do is what I want to get out are the final DFT values here. And so what does this formula tell me for how to get x of 0? It says take g of 0 and add to it h of 0 multiplied by wn to the 0. Right? So I'm going to make that notation with this kind of diagram like this. It's like saying, you know, take this and add to it th this entry on the diagonal multiplied by wn to the 0. How do I get x1? It's g1 plus wn to the 1 times h1. Similar idea. And so I can kind of fill in the top half of this diagram. And then how do I get x4? Well. It's like saying take g4 plus wn to the 4 power h4. But I know that since these guys are length 4 DFTs, g4 and h4 correspond to g0 and h0. So that's just like basically saying take this guy and multiply them in this way. And this completes a kind of a schematic picture of what's happening, right? I put the even and the odd signals through shorter DFTs, and I combine those DFTs in a specific way to get my final output. All right, so let me pause and ask, are there any questions about how I did all this magic? Actually, if you look at the, um, if you look at the cover of your book, which people may or may not have bought. Right? So I mean the cover of this book has, you know, DFTs on it, right? You can see that this this picture is actually a picture of a DFT. So it's not just like a useless picture. Okay. And so what do I gain by doing this? Okay. So let's think about, you know, originally for my my capital N DFT, normally I would need N squared multiplications, okay? So how many multiplications do I need for this thing? Well, here, again, if I'm just doing this DFT in a naive way, I have N over 2 squared multiplications. Here, I have another N over 2 squared multiplications. And then over here, I basically have N extra multiplications that have to happen to kind of combine the things to get the output. And so what do I have in the end? Well, this is n squared over 4. This is n squared over 4. And so this is only n. So in total, what I have is roughly n squared over 2 multiplications, right? So by writing things in this way, I reduce my multiplications by half, 
Okay, so that's already pretty good. But now I think, okay, well, why, you know, why would I stop there, right? So again, here in this case, this is again an even number, right? So why don't I just redo the process for these shorter DFTs, right? So I could turn this block into two uh, length two DFTs, right? So let me kind of rewrite this diagram. And again, this is where having the slides in PDF form will help. You don't have to try and write all this stuff down in your notes yourself if you don't want to. So let me rewrite this to break this down further. And so what would happen in the top half? This would be like saying, okay, I'm going to take the even parts of this input and the you know odd parts, which correspond to these entries. And then here I'd have these be like the corresponding even parts and odd parts of this. <coughs> so I basically have to reorder the input in a slightly different way. I basically say, okay, I take the kind of parts here, and then I have these guys, and then I have these guys, and I have these guys. So I reorder the input, and then both of these guys get put through a length n over 4, which in this case equals 2 DFT. This is like the most drawing intensive lecture. This one and the next one I'm going to be doing a lot of drawing. Okay, so then what comes out basically are, you know, I'm just going to make like little dots here to kind of remind myself there are these nodes that I'm combining, okay? So again, here I want to take these four numbers and combine them to get four outputs. This is where your brain starts to cook a little bit. So what happens here, this is like saying, okay, well, again, to get this output, I have to combine these two guys. And what am I going to multiply them by? Well, I'm going to multiply them by Wn to the zero power. To get these guys, I need to multiply these guys by Wn squared. To get these guys, I need to multiply them by Wn to the fourth. And to get these guys, I need to multiply it by the Wn to the sixth. And then in a similar way, I can draw this guy here. I have a similar set of combinations. Now I've got my kind of intermediate, uh, you know, DFTs. And then I say, okay, well, now I have to combine those DFTs to get my final capital X's that I want. So eventually I want to get these guys. And to combine these guys, I need to use a slightly different diagram, right? I combine these two to get this and these two to get this. This is just kind of duplicating the diagram I had on the previous page. And then again, make my life a little bit easier here. And then I have these extra factors here. And so again, now my life is a little bit even easier because all I have to do in terms of making any DFTs at all is what's inside these boxes, right? Everything else is just combining little pieces. Question? I just have a question. So what is the difference between if you just start by dividing four instead of like divide by two, two times? Right. So that's a good question. So the question is, why couldn't I divide by four initially, right? And so. What I'm teaching you right now is what's called a radix 2 DFT, which means that in every case I split things by 2. There is such a thing called a radix 4 DFT, which means that if I knew that I was divisible by 4 in the first place, I could decompose things into length, you know, I could, I could make this into this kind of right away and combine them in a direct way. So there is such a thing as a radix 4 DFT, but this is not that, right? But I mean, why is like 2 and 4 anyway? I mean, why could it be like 3, 5, or... 
Well, so the – so certainly, you know, I don't know. Actually, that's a good question. I don't think – part of the reason is that the – I don't think that you could have like an odd radix DFT that would work very well. Like if your thing was divisible by three, you could make things in terms of, I guess, length, you know, n over three DFTs and combine them, but you kind of lose the computational efficiency because, I mean, part of it is that – what we're going to show in a second is that this gets super efficient when your n is a power of two, right? And so typically what you do is you zero pad the DFT that you want to be the nearest power of two, and then you use the super efficient thing to drive it down to very simple operations. So you would never compromise and instead take, you know, the nearest power of three would be less efficient because one thing – one reason for that that I can think of off the top of my head is that, you know, these length two DFTs end up being very simple, as I'll show you in just a second, right? Whereas at its heart, a length three FD – a length three DFT still implies two complex multiplications by, you know – like if I do a length three DFT, I still have to multiply by this complex number and this complex number, right? Whereas a length two DFT, as it turns out, I only have to multiply by this number and this number, right? So here there are still some residual complex multiplies I can't get rid of, and here there's just adds and subtracts. So that's one reason why I wouldn't do it. But you're right. There is a radix four DFT that I'm not teaching you that it's in the book that you could read more about. That's a good question. Okay. So let me just finish up this by saying, okay, well, now at this point, this is about as um, far as I can go, right? So how could I – you know, what, what exactly is this – length two DFT here, right? Well, let's write the equation, right? So if I have a length two DFT, right? So say I have, you know, X zero and X one, and I'm turning that into these two guys. What is my formula? Well, my formula is capital XK equals the sum from N equals zero to one of XN W sub 2 to the n k. What is, what is W sub 2? Well, W sub 2 is like this number here, which is just negative 1, right? So this is actually a very easy thing to write. This is like saying I have 0 to 1, x of n, negative 1 to the n k. And so if I write this out, that's saying that x of 0 is just like taking these two entries and adding them, and x of 1 is taking these two entries and subtracting them, right? So actually, a length 2 DFT is no computation at all. It's just adding and subtracting numbers, right? So there's no, there's no multiplication here at all. And so that means that – and this is a point where I wish I had brought a scissors or something – that means that I can take well, – I can try and be kind of clever about this. I can take the left hand of this diagram. And again, let me just rewrite my left hand side. This is dumb. I should write it like this, right? So, what I want to do is this. I want to say, okay, actually, all I need to do is take these numbers And to get to these nodes, so let's see, these are these are my nodes here. All I need to do here are these very simple operations where all I'm doing is multiplying this by plus one here and this by minus one here. Right? So these smallest DFTs are actually really simple. And so at the end of the day, what you can see is that the length 8 DFT can be decomposed like this. And at the end, well, I mean, how many complex multiplies are there, right? Not very many. Um, the one way to think about it is that there are, you know, how many stages of decomposition can I do, right? So suppose that n is a uh, power of 2. So If n is power of 2, we can kind of recursively – 
break the DFT into how many stages? Well, basically, we have log 2 of n stages, right? So n was 8, and this picture, I basically have three stages, right? 1, 2, 3. And so that means that at every stage, how much computation do I need? Well, every stage, all I'm doing is multiplying by these complex numbers, right? I have n multiplies to do at every stage. So that means that I have, you know, n log 2 of n multiplies. Okay. And that's where the, the computational savings comes in, right? So again, what I said earlier was that if n was, say, 2 to the 10th, which is approximately 1,000. So that's the difference between n squared multiplies, which is like, you know, approximately a million, versus n log n, which is equal to approximately 10,000, right? So this is a speed up of 100 times, right? So that's kind of why we want to do FFTs in this way. It's like saying, okay, well, if you were to just kind of follow your nose and multiply it like it was a matrix, then you'd be losing out on all the computational savings that you could get. And in fact, well, let me play stop and ask. Are there any questions about that? So in fact, you can do even better, a little bit better, by observing that, you know, in each of these stages, right, there's kind of a pattern that you can see because these lines look so nice, right? So in each stage, I'm taking two elements and I'm getting two other elements, right? And there's a fundamental kind of a unit, right, where what I have are two elements here and two elements here, and I'm always combining the same two in this way. Here I have some power of n, let's call it wn to the r, and here I have wn to the r plus n over 2. Let's just kind of verify that in my picture here. So if I look back at this, this is like saying, for example, to get, say, these two elements, right, I'm multiplying by wn to the 1 and wn to the 5. These are separated by wn to the 4, right, which is, you know, 4 is 8 over 2. So these guys are always separated by 4. And in the same way, these guys are separated by 4, these guys are separated by 4. So there's always this kind of, you know, pattern between what I'm multiplying by. And, you know, one thing to observe is something from what we said earlier. This is like saying I have wn to the r, wn to the n over 2. And this guy is just equal to negative 1, right? So this is like saying I have wn to the r negative. And so really what I'm doing is I'm multiplying this guy on top by this number and this guy in the bottom by this number. And so if I wanted to instead, I could make this easier by saying, okay, what I'm going to do is before I, before I do this thing, I'm going to multiply the guy in the bottom by wn to the r, and then all I have to do is add it here and subtract it here. Right? So I just saved myself another factor of two multiplications by just rearranging things a little bit. Okay? So that's great. That means that actually I have much, I have half fewer computations than I had before. So also, uh, another nice thing about this is that, you know, again, I'm not a computer scientist, but I know computer scientists are always worried about uh, storage of things, right? How much kind of scratch space or storage do I need to compute my, you know, for my algorithm to work, right? And so one kind of cool thing is that if I look back at this picture, I can imagine that since I'm always using these two elements to get to these two elements, I guess I should say like this, right? So I can basically have a single array that is constantly being overwritten when I compute my DFT, right? So what I could do is I can start by seeding the array with this, and then, I guess maybe I should probably say it like this, right? So I can start by seeding my output array with the input in this special order, right? And then I overwrite these two elements with the sum of the difference, same with these guys. Then I overwrite these two elements with this special product, right? And then at the end, I overwrite these two elements by this special product. So the idea is that I can compute things in place, right? If I need to compute 
a length n dft, the only space I need to allocate is a length n vector that is continuously updated as I go through the stages of the FFT, right? So that's also pretty slow. So let me just write that down. So basically, since uh, the pth and qth values in the m minus first stage are uh, used to get the pth and qth values in the nth stage, the computation can be done what's called in place. meaning no extra storage. Right? All I need to do is write my input in this kind of interesting you know, order before I start doing my computations. Right? And actually, even the order is kind of neat. So if I were to write, just in the case of this 8 DFT, if I were to write these indices in binary, right? You can see that if I were to flip these around, if I were to reverse the order, I'm actually getting the binary numbers in order. Oops. Right, so this is basically called the bit reverse order of the input. Right, so it's not like some sort of random arrangement of the inputs. If I have a length n thing, all I have to do is flip the order of the bits, and suddenly I've got the right order of things to put into the DFT. So that's also pretty slick. So that means that there's not like a complicated formula to figure out how should I arrange these inputs to put them in, right? So for those of you that are more on the computer science side, then probably this is the kind of thing that excites you about all the things that you could do to make this efficient, right? Okay. So let me just say a, a word about uh, what this means for thinking about these as matrices, right? Because so, I'm a linear algebra guy, so I like to think about things in terms of, of matrices. And so let's see what we concluded from a linear algebra perspective. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my uh, matrix vector product, uh, okay, I've already made this too small. So this is going to be a big 8 by 8 matrix. So this is going to be my output. So So to get these eight numbers, I'm multiplying a large, well, eight, eight by eight is not really so large, but it's large on my paper, a large thing by my inputs. So I'm trying to be a little bit careful about little x and big x. So these are little x's over here. I guess I didn't make these too even. Okay, and so let's go back to my, you know, my formula for the DFT in the first place, right? So, right, I have this is my formula, and so what does that mean for like the first entry x of zero? That's like saying k is zero in this sum, and all that's changing is n, right? So that's like saying that on the first row, well, actually, if k is zero, I have w n to the zero power. So that means that the first row is entirely ones. What does it mean for the second row? Well, that's like saying that I'm taking w, in this case, 8. So here it's like saying n equals 8, k equals 1, and I'm changing n, right? So I have wn, w8 to the 0 power, again, is 1. w8 to the 1 power is this. 
W8 squared is this. W8 cubed, I know, is this. W8 to the fourth is where I get a simplification of minus one. W8 to the fifth is going to be this. So there's basically like a nice symmetry here. Oops, I think I got this slightly mixed up. W8 to the fifth should be this, right? Okay, now over here in the next column I have one W8 squared. W8 to the fourth is again this. W8 to the sixth is again this. And then I basically double this row again. Then I have one W8 cubed. W8 to the sixth is gonna be making sure I didn't screw this up. Draw a little picture. So again, these are my W's. All right, so this is W8, W8 squared, W8 cubed, W8 to the fourth, which is equal to minus one, W8 to the fifth, which is equal to, uh, oh yeah, you know, it's, whoops, wait, what? Yeah, I think I screwed this up. Let's think about this for a second. So actually, this is actually negative W8, right? Because it's flipping this around. So I'm, I forgot about the real part and the complex part of getting negated. And this is like negative W8 squared, and this is like negative W8 cubed. And actually, again, there are even further simplifications, right? This is like negative J. This is like positive J. All right, let's start over again. Uh, yeah, 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 I know. I screwed up. Here we go. This is really high-tech teaching we're getting. Nation's top technological university. What? Perfect. All right, let's try this again. Actually teaching. All right, so I'm happy with the first part. Very nice. Okay. So again, this is definitely a row of ones. Okay. Next row is going to be 1, W8, W8 squared, W8 cubed. And actually, if I was really a little bit careful about this, I could even say that this is just like uh, negative J. But I guess I'm not going to do that. Then W8 to the fourth is negative 1. W8 to the fifth, like we showed here, is negative W8. Then I have w, negative W8 squared, negative W8 cubed. Which is actually what it says in my notes. It was just that I was too cocky and didn't do it right. Okay, so then let's do the next row. The next row is going to be here to here to here to here. So basically it's like saying I have one. I'm going to make this even easier on myself. Next row, I'm going to be going by factors of W8 cubed. So when I go one, two, three here, then I go one, two, three here, so I'm gonna get J, then I'm gonna get W8, then I'm gonna get negative one. All right, so now I'm just gonna kinda of start to fill these in because I think this is not that exciting to watch. This next one has a special pattern. So I'm just going to fill in the rest of these guys from my notes because I know this is not so exciting. So what am I trying to do here? All I want to do is look at this matrix and start to observe some symmetries, okay? So let's look at the 
even columns. Okay, so I'm going to kind of split this up by columns. So the even columns, basically the top half and the bottom half are the same, right? This whole thing is the same as this. This whole thing is the same as this. This whole thing is the same as this, right? And in the odd columns, this is the opposite of this, right? So this and this are negatives, okay? So what does this mean? This is kind of like saying that I can write this whole matrix in a slightly different way. So all I'm doing is kind of writing the first decomposition of the DFT in a slightly different way. It's like saying if I want to get these outputs, what I could do is I could rearrange these inputs, right? So now I'm going to take the even entries and the odd entries. And so what's going to multiply the even entries? Well, again, to make this kind of like uh, precise, let's look at, you know, what is this even entry matrix look like, right? What's multiplying the even entries? So kind of want to, maybe I should hold on to this for a second. So what I want to say is that even columns is like the identity matrix, a four by four identity matrix, right? So this is like an eight by four matrix multiplied by I'll just write down what those numbers were. And actually, this thing, if I'm being observant, right, this is just like saying, okay, W8 squared can be simplified to be equal to W4, right? So this is like saying I have W4 to the 1 power, W4 to the 2 power, W4 to the 3 power, right? And this matrix here is exactly the same as the uh, DFT matrix for n equals 4. Right? This is kind of like the decomposition of the matrix into the smaller DFT. So that's like saying that to get the even parts, I need the four DFT matrix. And if I look back at my matrix and I say, okay, now I want to look at the odd columns, what is the matrix that I'm multiplying by there? So it's like saying that the odd columns that's like saying that I have the top part is the negative of the bottom part. And the matrix that I'm multiplying there, if I just copy it down, is going to be this. And this guy, if I kind of factor this out a little bit, this is like saying, okay, I can take, I can take out a factor of basically a diagonal matrix where the entries are this. And what's left is the same Fourier matrix I had before. Right? So if I kind of think about this, this is like saying, okay, the top row is all ones. The next row is W8 times each of these things, right? And this here is the same 
Fourier matrix I had before. So kind of putting it all together, kind of what I'm saying is that the eight by eight Fourier matrix is like taking identity matrices. These are the even columns here. These are the odd columns here. In one of these guys, I have an identity. In the other guy, I have this matrix of factors. And then over here, I have two length four Fourier transforms. And then over here, I have the even entries and the odd entries. Right? So what I'm trying to get at is that here I'm kind of exposing the fact that these are the length four DFTs. These are like the, so these entries here, the way I was taught, we would call them twiddle factors, not very scientific, but that's the way I learned it. So these extra elements of W n to the whatever power that you have to multiply by are these. And then these are basically the sums and the differences in, again, butterfly. So I learned that the little pattern I had was called the butterfly. So I should have said that earlier. So the kind of fundamental, uh, the kind of fundamental element of the DFT is this picture here, right? And I learned that this was called the butterfly, right? So I, if I refer to butterflies, that's what I mean, right? So that's what's happening is that for every butterfly, I have a sum and a difference and a multiplication by a complex number. And that's what I see here. This is the sum, this is the difference, this is the multiplication by a complex number, and these are the length four DFTs. And if I wanted to, I could further decompose these into length two DFTs with additional twiddle factors, right? So that's kind of the idea of um, looking at this from a more matrix algebra kind of way, which I think is sometimes instructive. So one more thing I want to say about this before I talk about the exams is that, so this is called a decimation in time strategy. And the reason for that is that what I'm doing is I'm kind of taking the time domain signal and I'm chunking it up into different pieces. Like I keep on separating it out into smaller and smaller subunits, right? There's also something called decimation in frequency FFT. And all that means is that suppose that instead of keeping the output order fixed and shuffling around the input, I keep the input order fixed and shuffle around the output. So one way to think about this is that here is my DFT equation again. And now let's suppose I ask for, you know, just the even samples of this, right? That's like saying I have x of even samples for n minus 1 over 2 elements, right? So if I plug in 2r here, what I get is this sum here. I'm sorry, 2n, 2nr. And again, this is where I observe that, let me make this a little bit trickier. I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to split this into the first, the first uh, half of the elements and the second half of the elements. I guess I don't know why I had this n over 2. It's n over 2 minus 1. So it's like saying the first half of the elements, the second half of the elements. And now, again, this looks like a shorter DFT, and this can also be thought of as a shorter DFT. So I'm going to say this here looks like
this is where I have my shorter DFT over just the first half. And then over here, this is like saying, well, I can re-index this from n equals 0 to n over 2 minus 1 of x of n plus n over 2. And then I have wn 2 to the n plus n over 2 r. And again, I can see that here, you know, I'm going to have some cancellations because wn to the 2 times n over 2 r is just going to be uh, 1. And actually, I can, I can collect this kind of in an interesting way. So I can collect this like this. What this is like doing is it's like saying I can get the even entries of the output, right? I started with the even entries of the output by adding up the even half, or I'm sorry, the top half and the bottom half of the input, and then taking a shorter DFT of that, right? So this is like an n over 2 DFT of the summed input, basically top half plus bottom half. And the same way, you can show that uh, for odd entries of x of k, you can basically show that the odd entries look like a shorter DFT applied to the difference between the top half and the bottom half. And again, I have a extra little factor, this twiddle factor, that comes into play. And so again, just in the same way, I mean, this looks actually pretty similar to the decimation in time. The only thing that I'm doing is that I'm now I'm getting the output in terms of even entries and odd entries, and I can keep the input in the same order if I wanted to. And so again, this is really kind of like a your choice situation about whether you want to, you know, get the output in a weird order or get the input in a weird order, right? Um, in fact, you can show that these algorithms are basically equivalent to decimation in time. Um, and you don't really, I mean, there's no computational difference either. You just kind of have a slightly different butterfly. So instead of having a butterfly where you do the twiddle factors on the front end, you have a butterfly that you do the twiddle factors on the back end. So it's like saying, I add these two elements, I subtract these two elements, and then I multiply these guys by an extra complex factor. So this is like butterfly for the decimation in frequency FFT. So I mean, you can show that any decimation in time can be flipped around to be a decimation in frequency. Okay. So that's kind of the basic idea. And so what it comes down to is that we can do DFTs very easily just by a series of stages. And each stage, all I'm doing is adding and subtracting elements and doing this little twiddle to modify things for the next stage, right? And so this is already pretty slick. What I want to talk about next time is actually an even smoother way of doing this when I can eliminate these twiddle factors entirely, which is kind of nice. And so actually, um, you know, what we're going to show next time is that suppose I wanted to do a length 15 DFT, right? So one option is turn into a length 16 DFT by zero padding and do a, do a power of two DFT. The other thing is I can take a length 15 DFT and it turns out I can turn it into a bunch of length 3 DFTs and length 5 DFTs, right? So I basically am factoring the uh, dimensionality of the input and it's kind of like a, a fact of like a prime factoring algorithm where I say, okay, you know, in what way can I break down the input into its most basic components, right? 
So if I had a length, you know, so say I had a length 80 DFT, right? 80 is equal to 16 times 5, right? So I have 2 to the 4th times 5. And so the idea is that I could turn this into a whole bunch of length 2 and length 5 DFTs with no twiddle factors using the method I'm going to show you in the next class. And so we'll talk about that, obviously, in the next class. So any questions about what I showed you today? All right, so all this material is covered in the textbook in, uh, so basically the DFT by itself is covered in chapter seven and the, uh,